Welcome to Luxoff Tech Talks, a series of podcasts in which IT gurus share their knowledge and discuss the latest trends and innovations in the world of IT. We are going to cover the most recent developments in the programming languages, frameworks, and technologies that are shaping the future of the software industry. This new format of online learning is part of Luxoft Learning Management and Development Services rebranding. Please share your feedback in the comments to let us know what speakers and topics you would like us to cover in later installments. Hello everyone, my name is Martin and in this uh, Luxoft Tech Talk session we'll be talking about how to build highly scalable data pipelines with Apache Spark. Uh, just before we start, a few short words about me. My name is Martin. Uh, I'm currently a software architect working for a company called Resolve Systems. And I also do some um, site trainings as part of my own company called Coffee Cup Consulting. I'm one of the guys responsible for the events of the Bulgarian Java User Group, where we run our own community conference called J Prime, focused on anything in the Java technologies area. And last year, we, we also won an Oracle Duke's Choice Award for our community activities. Aside from that, I also recently wrote a book on RabbitMQ. Um, so if you're interested in the topic, you can check out the book. So about this session, first we'll see what is Apache Spark from an eagle's eye. We'll see uh, what is the, why is it so popular? What's the specific about uh, Apache Spark? Then we'll move on into looking what is the type of um, data sets that Apache Spark deals with. Uh, how do we process data sets using transformations? We'll look into some notorious data sources that Apache Spark integrates with. And then uh, at the end of this session, we'll look into some of the machine learning capabilities provided by Apache Spark and how do we cluster Apache Spark uh, in production. So let's start. Uh, Apache Spark is a framework for a large scale distributed data processing. Originally it was written in Scala, but later on it was extended with, with support for more languages uh, like Java, Python, and R. Uh, the focus of this session would be uh, Java. And in fact, Apache Spark is one of the most contributed open source projects in GitHub with more than 1400 contributors. So it's, uh, it's quite popular. And how does Apache Spark differ from MapReduce? So MapReduce has been the original programming model used for a variety of use cases that have to deal with large scale distributed data processing. Uh, however, uh, Apache Spark has been developed in order to address many of the shortcomings of the MapReduce programming model. And in particular, these are real time data processing so the MapReduce pro model is very suitable for batch processing of present existing data, but not, not that very suitable for streaming data. Also operate, operations in MapReduce uh, are limited to the key value format of data, while in Spark that's not the case, because in Spark the data model is an acyclic graph. Also, uh, MapReduce is not really very suitable for large data processing on a single network, and Apache Spark tries to optimize this uh, and a, a number of other things such as for example Apache Spark is uh, also very suitable for online transaction processing also for graph processing based on the internal graph model that Apache Spark uses and also the MapReduce framework does not really address the problem of running sequential um, program uh, flows uh, along with the distributed execution model of the data and that's also addressed by Apache Spark. Spark, uh, in some regards, is also faster uh, than Hadoop, uh, as it basically depends on, more on RAM usage and it tries to minimize disk I.O. Uh, however, you can still use uh, Apache Spark along with Hadoop in several aspects. First, you can use um, Hadoop as a storage engine for Apache Spark and also as a compute engine. So Spark has both um, compute and storage engines pluggable architectures. And this is the way you can basically integrate it with Hadoop. These are the core components of the Spark framework. Uh, at the bottom, we have Spark Core, which provides the various facilities that we can use to manage the various types of Apache Spark data sets. On top of it, there are several distinct libraries being built such as Spark SQL, uh, very suitable for processing of batch uh, streams, Spark Streaming Library, suitable for streaming, um, stream processing, 
Uh, we have the machine learning library called MLib and a library for graph processing called GraphX. Uh, in addition, uh, if we are going to look into the general Spark architecture, if we want to write a Spark application, uh, the Spark application uses a Spark context, which is used to interact with the Spark cluster. The Spark context uh, might reside in a single um, and a separate, uh, as a separate application, uh, not part of the Spark cluster, or it might be a separate node part of the Spark cluster. Uh, and we deal with a variety of input and output data sources when we write our Spark applications. Uh, so we use the Spark context basically to provide the logic for our data processing pipelines, which are executed uh, by a so-called Spark cluster manager that's responsible to distribute those pipelines on one or more nodes of the Spark cluster. And those transformations then return a result back uh, to the cluster manager and through the Spark context back to the application when we want to retrieve data uh, from the Spark cluster. Now let's talk a bit about what are the Spark data sets and transformations uh, and how we deal with them. So uh, a Spark data set is the building block of Spark. Uh, and in earlier versions of Spark, they were called resilient distributed data sets. This is the format of the data set in Apache Spark, which is still supported in later Spark versions. So a Spark data set is basically an immutable collection of objects which are spread across a Spark cluster and stored either in RAM or in disk. They are created by means of distributed transformations uh, on the Spark cluster, and they also might be rebuilt in case a Spark node fails. Uh, there is also a newer format um, of a data set in Spark. Uh, it's provided by the so-called data frame API. Uh, in a way, you can feel, think of data frames as a superset of RDDs, and the data frame API is introduced in Spark 2.0. Uh, also, there is another API called the Dataset API, which provides a way to work with a combination of RDDs and data frames. And the Data Frame API is also the preferred way of representing data sets in Spark compared to RDDs due to the fact that it provides improved performance and more advanced operations on the data sets. Uh, this is how you can get started with Spark. So uh, assume, let's say, we, you have a simple list of items, uh, either coming from a third-party source or you create it somehow in your application. Then you create a new Spark uh, configuration provided by the Spark Conf class. You set some name for the Spark application and also you set uh, where does the master node um, reside and how many threads you're going to use. Uh, then you create Java Spark context based on that configuration. And from that context, you convert the list of items uh, to a Spark uh, RDD. That's the very basic use uh, of Apache uh, Spark and how you can convert an existing uh, Java list to a Spark dataset. And then when you have uh, that RDD available, you can apply a number of transformations on it, such as, for example, map filter, flat map, the map transformation um, basically takes an item from the data set, uh, modifies it and returns it. Uh, filter, filters, the filters uh, items based on some um, custom logic. You have flat map uh, that allows you to generate more than one item from a single one and so on and so forth. You also have some uh, set operations such, a new, such as union intersection, distinct and Cartesian. Many of these operations, you can see them uh, in other frameworks, which allow you to, to create and deal with streams of data. Uh, for example, you know, in later versions of the JDK, you have streams, API, uh, and so these operations probably are already very familiar to you. Also, you have transformations which are responsible to group data, such as group by and reduce by key. Um, these operations allow you basically to, to combine data based on a um, certain key. Another similar transformations include aggregate by key, sort by key, join, co-group, and so on. Um, some of the transformations in Apache Spark also work at the level of a single cluster node, such as, for example, map partitions and map partitions with index. 
uh, they basically allow you to process uh, particular uh, partition of data in a single cluster node rather than depend on the fact that this uh, particular data set needs to be distributed in the Spark cluster. Um, the number of partitions of an RDD can also be modified uh, during the data processing pipeline using the coalesce and repartition transformations, which are specific types of transformations. Uh, when you deal with transformations, you also need at some point to have terminal operations that basically take the data from the various nodes in the Spark cluster and return that data back uh, to the Spark manager and to the Spark driver from where the application can, can use the resulting uh, data. So Spark actions are in fact the terminal operations that produce results from the transformations and actions are in a way, are a way to communicate back uh, from the Spark cluster back to the Spark, Spark driver instance. And there are a number of actions provided by Apache Spark, uh, such as, for example, collect, reduce, count, first take. Most of them are quite intuitive. So based on the name of the, of the action, you understand what it does. We also have some special um, types of actions, such as for each, which allows to iterate over each of the items uh, from, of the data set that's returned to the Spark driver. You have save as text file or save as object file that allow you to save um, a data set uh, in a particular file. Uh, the newer data frame and data set APIs can be created using an instance of um, the Orc Apache Spark SQL Spark Session Plus. And as I already mentioned, they provide more advanced operations and such as, for example, capabilities to run SQL queries on the data. And the short example here, uh, first calls a create or replace temp view method on a particular um, data set, uh, which specifies a logical name for, for that um, temporary view. You can think of that temporary view as an equivalent of a view in a relational database table, if we can compare it like this. So this basically creates a particular uh, snapshot of, of a data set uh, in memory and out of that items temporary view, you can execute a particular SQL qu query such as select star from items. Uh, also, you can convert between the old and the new format of, uh, of a data set in Spark. For example, if you have an existing RDD and you want to convert it to a Spark data frame, uh, you can call the create data frame method on the Spark session instance by passing the, the RDD instance uh, and a bin class uh, on top of which you want to map uh, your Spark RDD. Uh, and an RDD can also be retrieved from a data set by calling the RDD methods of the data set. So let's talk now about different data sources that uh, Apache Spark uh, provides out of the box and also how can we supply our own data sources if you want to. Uh, so Spark can receive data from a variety of data sources uh, and these data sources might be of different type. For example, we might have batch data sources or real-time streaming data sources, such as, for example, message brokers. Uh, and these data sources uh, might be, for example, files. Uh, so Apache Spark supports uh, different types of, of file formats, such as JSON, CSV, Avro, and so on. Uh, these data sources might also be uh, the various relational databases. Spark provides the capability to interact with an, a relational database through either a JDBC or an ODBC driver. Uh, and also um, for real-time uh, streaming data sources, Apache Spark provides integration, as I mentioned, with a variety of message brokers such as RabbitMQ, Kafka, and so on, and also TCP sockets. So these are some examples of data sources that are uh, provided by Apache Spark. Uh, Apache Spark provides operations on both uh, batch and real-time data. Uh, for real-time data, there are two main APIs. The first one, Spark Streaming, works on top of the old format of Spark data sets uh, or RDDs. And the other one, which is Spark Structure Streaming, works on the newer format of data sets, uh, which are data frames or data sets. Uh, also, if, if there is a data source that's not provided uh, by default in Apache Spark, you can build your own. 
Uh, so Apache Spark provides capabilities to plug in additional data sources. Uh, for example, for streaming data sources, you can define your own custom receiver for the receival of data. Uh, now let's look at some particular data sources. Uh, for example, the file data source, uh, as I said, provides a variety of formats that allow Spark to read data from. Uh, and you can also implement your own uh, file data source format, of course. The default format for reading files that uh, Spark uses at present is called Parquet. And if you want to read a particular uh, file in that format, you can call the read method from the Spark session, and then you call the load method uh, by passing the, the location of the Parquet file. Uh, you can call the format method to specify the particular uh, format of the file you want to read from. Uh, in this particular example, we specify JSON and CSV as formats. Uh, and there are also some predefined methods you can use as a shorthand. For example, you can call the JSON method to read data from a JSON file. In a similar ways, datasets can also be written to a particular file. Uh, we have to call the write method. Um, of a particular data frame or data set. And then we call the format to specify the format in which we want to write. And then we call the save method. Uh, and for example, if you want to save uh, a data set in either uh, an object or a text file, we call the corresponding method, which is either save as object file or save as text file. If you want to have a MySQL data source uh, in our application, Spark provides uh, one for you out of the box, uh, and you can retrieve uh, data from it either using JDBC or ODBC. Uh, one of the requirements is that uh, the particular uh, driver uh, needs to be supplied with the driver class path option um, uh, on the Spark class path. And for MySQL, if you want to use um, um, the integration, uh, that's provided you need to have the connector J driver uh, supplied to Apache Spark. How you can use a JDBC data source? From Spark context, you call the read method. Uh, as format, you specify JDBC. And using the option methods, you specify the parameters for the JDBC connection. And, in, and then you call the load method. Uh, you can use a variety of options. Uh, out of the box that are provided, such as, for example, the query option, where you supply a subquery that provides the possibility to limit uh, the retrieved data, and a query timeout that specifies the timeout uh, for the JDBC query being executed. And also, you can save Spark datasets to a relational database table. Uh, again, uh, calling the write method, uh, you specify in addition a mode uh, that you want to use. In that particular case, we, are, we will be appending data to a table. Then we call the JDBC uh, method as a shorthand and we pass the, um, the JDBC URL. Then we pass the, the particular database table and some additional properties. If you want to start uh, with Spark Streaming, um, we need to take into account several things. In Spark Streaming, data is divided into uh, patches of data called D-streams or decentralized streams. So in a way, although we will, be, we will be receiving streaming data, Apache Spark internally aggregates data into smaller batches uh, before processing it. And typical use cases uh, for the integration of uh, Apache Spark with streaming sources is when we want to get data from messaging systems, as we already mentioned, such as Kafka, RabbitMQ, or ActiveMQ. And also we can enable fault tolerance using Spark streaming whereby data is stored in HDFS. So in order to get started with Spark Streaming, we need to uh, create an instance of Java Streaming context. Uh, and in that streaming context, we pass Spark configuration instance that provides information of, of our Spark application, such as name and where is the, the master node and how many uh, threads should it use. Uh, and then we specify, uh, in addition as a second parameter in the Java streaming context, the duration in which we are going to uh, push uh, the collected uh, batches of data for processing uh, by Apache Spark. So when we have uh, the Java streaming context created, we can create uh, a receiver from a variety of data sources 
or from our own Spark streaming receiver that we've created. So for example, to receive data from a network socket, you can call the socket text stream method and pass the, uh, the host name in the port on which we'll be listening for socket data. Uh, we can also be listening from, uh, for data from a file directory by calling the text file stream method. And for testing purposes, we can uh, use several methods, one of which is uh, the QStream method, which uh, allows us to uh, create streaming data source uh, from a stream of RDDs. So when we have created uh, the particular Spark streaming context, uh, we can create our data pipeline that would be triggered by Apache Spark based on the micro batches that are created from the Spark stream. Uh, and then you can start applying various transformations and actions on that particular data pipeline that are executed in a distributed fashion in the Spark cluster. And when we create our data pipeline, finally, uh, we need to start the Spark streaming context by calling the start method and invoking the await termination method, which is a blocking operation awaiting for termination. Uh, we can also create window streams uh, over the streaming data based on two different criteria, one of which is the length of the window stream and the other one is the, the sliding interval for the windows. Uh, streaming data sets can also be joined with other streaming or batch data sets, which is a very powerful capability by, uh, provided by Apache Spark. Uh, Spark structure streaming, uh, as we said, it, it provides uh, additional operations and works on the newer format of, of um, data sets in Spark. Uh, to get started with uh, Spark streaming, uh, you need to create Spark session instance and that Spark session instance, for example, if you want to create a read stream uh, from a particular data source, you create called the read stream method. Uh, you supply the type of data source for which you will be reading data from. In that particular case, it's a socket input stream. And then using the option methods, you supply the specific options that are specific for that uh, input data source. And then you call the load method. Uh, a schema can also be supplied if, uh, if needed on the streaming data using the schema methods uh, on the read stream. In a similar way, you can also uh, write data in a streaming fashion. Uh, you call the write stream method and uh, you supply some additional configuration and where you'll be writing uh, the streaming data to. And then you call the wait termination method to wait uh, for some uh, interruption uh, for the write stream. And we can use a different number of uh, write syncs. Uh, many of them are provided by Spark out of the box, such as file, Kafka, for each. Uh, and for testing purposes, you can use console or memory. If you want to use Kafka as a streaming data source, uh, Apache Spark provides out of the box integration with Apache Kafka, both through the Spark streaming and Spark structure, structure streaming frameworks. And if we want to create a Spark, uh, a Kafka source, uh, we call the uh, Kafka as a format. Uh, in this particular example, uh, we are going to uh, create a batch stream uh, for Kafka. And uh, supplying the different options, we can specify uh, what is the Kafka queue to use um, and so on. So uh, batch query results uh, or a Kafka scene can be created with either the write or write stream methods. In order to get started using um, Spark streaming with Apache Kafka, you need to supply a particular Maven dependency, which is identified by the Spark streaming Kafka artifact ID. Uh, and this is an example of how you can create a stream data source out of Apache Kafka, you create a map of parameters that specify different configurations and how, what criteria you will be using to read data uh, from a Kafka topic. Uh, then uh, you create um, a list of topics out of which you will be reading uh, data. And then uh, you create a Java input uh, data stream uh, by passing a, a stream created using the Kafka utils uh, class. 
and that will create that will create for you uh, a Kafka input data stream uh, that you can start and you can start processing uh, data from Apache Kafka in your Spark pipelines. If you want to use uh, Kafka with the Spark structure streaming framework, you need another dependency uh, as part of your project. So this Maven dependency uh, is the Spark SQL Kafka uh, library. Um, and this, uh, this is an example of how you can use it with Spark structure streaming framework. Uh, you call the read stream uh, method to create an input stream um, for Apache Kafka. You specify that the format is Kafka. And it's using the option methods, you supply the various configuration for uh, connecting to the uh, Kafka instance. And now let's see how um, Apache Spark works in action. So we'll be looking into how to uh, create batch data source from MySQL and stream one from Apache Kafka and how to write back the information from the, from the Spark pipeline back to MySQL. So I'm going to, to open Eclipse, uh, just to increase the font a bit for you. Okay, so I'm going to supply a slightly bigger text font so we can see better what, what happens. Okay, so in the first example, I'm going to create uh, a, batch, a batch stream from a MySQL uh, table. Uh, I'm going to create a Spark session instance. I'm going to supply item processing as the name of my Spark application. Uh, my Spark application uh, would be uh, having a single master node which runs a uh, local host and uses four threads for the processing. And then I call the get or create uh, method to create the instance. The nice thing about um, developing applications with Apache Spark is that you can write them directly in Eclipse using the proper dependencies. And when you run your application, uh, the Apache Spark instance will be started behind the scenes for you and the application will be deployed. So you don't need first to start a separate and dedicated Apache Spark instance and then somehow provide deployment for your application to that Spark instance. That happens automatically behind the scenes when you're developing an application for Apache Spark. Then we create an item encoder, uh, which basically specifies that we'll be uh, transforming our data to a particular item bin. And this item bin has several fields. An item represents some product, which has a name, description, unit price, some weight, and whether it's fragile or not. When we create that encoder uh, out of our Spark session, we call the read method. Uh, as a format, we specify JDBC. Uh, we pass the JDBC rel, uh, which points to a Spark database on localhost. We specify that we'll be getting data from the items table, and we supply the user and the password. Then we, we, we can use for convenience the short method that just shows a subset of the data that's received from, from Apache Spark. And then we call the map method to, to create an item instance out of, out of the, our Spark um, RDD, which uh, our Spark data set, which uh, is represented by a row instance. If, if you don't specify any particular uh, type, Apache uh, Spark uses a row class to represent the data that's received from the data source. Okay, and if I'm going to have a peek into what do I have in that Spark items, Table. Uh, I'm going to see I have some slightly more than 200,000 uh, items in place. Uh, and if I run that example, I'm going to see that um, Apache Spark loads behind the scenes for me. And I wait for some time uh, for my application to start up and get deployed to the Spark instance. So you can see the two show methods being uh, invoked. And I see the, the part of the data here um, in the table form uh, that's provided by me. 
So that's how you can get data from MySQL. If you want to retrieve data from, from Kafka, um, I'm going to show you the following example. So uh, I'm, I'm going to uh, read data from Kafka using the Spark um, streaming framework. Uh, and using the Spark streaming framework, uh, I create first an instance of Spark configuration, similar to how I did it with MySQL. Then I create a Java, a Java streaming context, applying the Spark configuration and a duration of three seconds. The durations class provides a number of convenience methods to provide what would be the duration between the batches uh, for a stream processing by Apache Spark. Then I supply the configuration for my uh, Kafka instance. Locally, I've started uh, a Zookeeper instance and an Apache Kafka instance that uses it. Uh, then I specify I'll be reading uh, data from a single Kafka topic, which is called Spark. I've pre-created pre already that topic in Kafka. Uh, and then I create the stream using the Kafka Utils class. Then out of that stream, I create a very simple transformation that uses the map method uh, to, to get the value um, from the item that I've received uh, from Kafka. Uh, this, this item uh, is of type consumer record, which has two things, the key and value, uh, supplied from, from Kafka. Then I call the print method to print some of the items and the count method uh, to see what's the count of items uh, in, in Kafka that I've managed to read. Then I start the st Java streaming context to start receiving batches of data and I wait for termination. Before I run the example, I've prepared a very simple generator of items that recreates for me 100 items in the Spark in the Kafka topic that I've created. Uh, and when I supply those items, I'll go back to my example. I'll run it. I'll open the console in Eclipse. And if I wait for some time, uh, Okay, I, I, I get into some issue here. So, uh, I see basically I, I'm, I'm getting some issue when I try to read data from Kafka, uh, which terminates my, my application. Uh, and if we want to look into uh, what, what's the issue, uh, we, we can see uh, that I've, I'll just run, rerun the example just to make sure it's not some Kafka configuration issue. Okay, uh, seems I have some issue with my broker, uh, but the idea is that Apache Spark starts up, tries to connect to Kafka and will start reading. First, it will read my 100 items that I've supplied uh, in the Kafka topic and then it will start listening for more, more items and every three seconds it will process those batch of items that it managed to receive from Apache Kafka. And if you want to see an integrated example of, of how we can combine what we saw with MySQL and Kafka, we can use an integrated item processing application, uh, which first uh, creates a batch uh, data source uh, using JDBC that connects to the MySQL database. Um, here in a special DB table um, option, I specify that I'll just read the first 100 items from the database table, which effectively allows me to filter out data from the database table. Uh, and then I'll create a, a Kafka stream. Um, in fact, I'll be creating a batch stream from Kafka, but you can without any restriction, create a stream uh, from Kafka and combine that with the batch stream from, from the database. So I'll be reading the data from Kafka, uh, from the Spark topic. Uh, I'll be using a particular expression which allows me to supply how should Apache Spark treat the type of the key and the value uh, that is received from Kafka, in that particular case, a string. Uh, then I create a Kafka items data set 
based on the, the options that I've supplied. Uh, and then I call the union method on the database uh, items data sets to combine them with the ones received from Kafka. And then I print the combined count. And if there is no issue with the setup, uh, if I run this example and open the console, I should be able to see the combined count from the records read from, read from Kafka and the database. So we should wait for some time. And bump, we get into the same error we saw in the previous example, uh, which we're not going to debug during the session, but uh, here you should get a total count of the items from the database in Kafka. Uh, that's, that's how you can uh, combine um, the two data sources. Uh, you have a number of options here. Uh, we just saw how you can do that with, with batch data sources. Now, let's talk a bit about the machine learning capabilities uh, provided by Apache Spark, which are uh, very powerful. And uh, the fact that all the machine learning capabilities provided by Apache Spark are built in a way so that they work in a distributed fashion makes them uh, highly recommended if you want to supply uh, some machine learning capabilities as, as part of your Spark pipeline. Uh, so the library that provides the machine learning capabilities is called Spark MLib. Uh, and the library supports the formats of data sets that uh, Spark uses. Uh, in order to use MLib, you need to supply a separate Maven dependency, uh, which is uh, the Spark MLib dependency. And the machine learning library in Apache Spark provides a number of things such as machine learning algorithms, featureization utilities uh, that allow you to uh, part convert particular um, and specify which fields from a particular data set are going to use as features uh, used for the various machine learning algorithms. Uh, you can create machine learning pipelines uh, here uh, and you also can persist the various algorithms, models, and pipelines if you want to. Uh, you can also use, in addition, additional utilities for linear algebra, statistics, and data handling, even if you don't want to use any machine learning capabilities. These are supplied in addition uh, in, by MLIP. So MLIP uses the data frame as the primary data set format, uh, and older versions of MLIP also work on top of RDDs, but that's already in maintenance mode, so you should prefer using data frames. Uh, in terms of machine learning algorithms, uh, we have implementations of the following categories of algorithm. We have uh, classification, uh, regression and clustering algorithms, as well as collaborative filtering algorithms uh, implemented as part of the MLIP library. Uh, and you can combine the various algorithms along with different utilities for data processing in the form of so-called machine learning pipelines. They basically allow you to combine different machine learning algorithms and they are inspired by the Python scikit-learn project, which in fact is an inspiration of many machine learning libraries uh, out there. So to create a pipeline uh, using Spark MLIP, first you create a tokenizer that allows you to split a particular text uh, in uh, one or more words. When you create that tokenizer, you apply a hashing transformation uh, based on the uh, words that you've generated from the tokenizer and you specify that you'll be uh, set, saving this hashing transformation result in a, in a separate uh, column in the data set, in Spark data set. Then you create an instance of a logistic regression algorithm that you want to apply uh, on the data set uh, that you've already processed using the tokenizer and the hashing transformation. And finally, out of those three, you build a pipeline by calling the set stages method and supplying each one of them as a pipeline stage. Now, let's see how, how does clustering work in Apache Spark. Um, so Apache Spark provides uh, the possibility to plug in uh, a, a 
different cluster manager. So by default, Apache Spark has a standalone scheduler or a built-in cluster manager that it uses, which for a variety of use cases might be sufficient. But you also want, may want to include a, a different cluster manager and Apache Spark out of the box provides support for, for Yarn, Mesos, and also there is experimental support for Kubernetes as a cluster manager. So the standalone, if you want to uh, run an Apache Spark cluster using the standalone cluster manager, uh, Spark provides several utilities that, that allow you to manage a standalone cluster, such as the Start Master uh, tool, which allows you to start a Spark Master instance, uh, and also a Start Slave tool that allows you to run uh, one or more Spark Slave uh, nodes or worker nodes that connect to a particular Spark master. Uh, also, you, there is a very uh, convenient UI that's provided uh, as part of the master node that allows you to inspect uh, the, the, the standalone cluster topology. Uh, applications can be deployed in an existing Apache Spark cluster using the Spark submit utility that's part of the Spark installation. And the standalone cluster has either client or cluster mode of operation. Uh, so the utility, in fact, can be either run separately or Spark part of the Spark cluster. Uh, and this means that the Spark driver instance either runs as a separate instance or part of the Spark cluster. Uh, you specify the particular mode with the deploy mode parameter of the Spark submit utility. Uh, there are also additional scripts available that allow you to start and stop cluster nodes. Um, so there is also utility to, uh, that allow in particular to stop either the master node or one of the slave nodes. Uh, if you want to establish high availability for some of the nodes in the cluster, uh, that's provided, uh, you can use, for example, um, Apache Zookeeper, uh, so you can register multiple master Spark nodes, for example, against the Zookeeper instance, and in that manner, uh, you will be supplying high availability for the Spark master nodes. If you want to run a Mesos cluster, uh, a Mesos master node can be used uh, as a cluster manager instead of Spark master node. Uh, and the various Spark workers are in fact Spark Mesos executors uh, which are supplied with the Spark package to run. The Spark package is supplied using uh, a special parameter that's part of the Spark configuration, uh, or you can use the Spark executor URI environment variable. And when you specify that, the package is distributed to all the Spark Mesos executors that you bring up in the Spark cluster. And the Spark driver can also run uh, as part of the Mesos cluster. Um, there is a Mesos cluster dispatcher that must be started to facilitate the cluster mode of operation. Uh, that's the, provided by the Spark Mesos dispatcher utility. You can also specify additional configuration parameters uh, for your Mesos cluster, such as Spark executor memory and Spark executor cores uh, that allow you to specify how much memory and cores you sh uh, your uh, instances should take up. You, there are also some additional properties that you can specify. And the Spark tasks within the Mesos executors can be run as per, separate Mesos tasks, uh, but that mode of operation is deprecated in Apache Spark. You can also use Yarn uh, as a cluster manager and have a Yarn master instance serve the purpose of a cluster manager in Apache Spark. Uh, and it also provides the mode of operation uh, such as plant cluster. And as we mentioned, there is also some experimental support for using Kubernetes as a cluster manager for Apache Spark. Uh, and the way it works is that the Spark driver is created as a separate Kubernetes pod. Uh, the Spark driver creates the Spark executors uh, also uh, in separate Kubernetes pods. And when the application completes, executor pods uh, are brought down. And the Spark Submit utility can be used to deploy Spark applications in a Kubernetes cluster. In terms of application dependencies, 
Many real applications use a variety of dependencies. And if you want to deploy an application uh, in Apache Spark, you also need to have a way to splice those, de those dependencies to the Spark cluster. In order to do that, there are several options that you can specify as part of the Spark submit utility, such as the jars parameter, where you can list one or more jar files, or the packages parameter where you supply Maven dependencies. Or, and you can also use the repository parameter to supply different than the Maven central uh, repositories. And as a summary, uh, what we've covered, uh, Apache Spark is one of the most feature-rich and developed big data processing frameworks. There is a variety of competitors of Apache Spark out there, such as Apache Flink. Uh, you can use different kinds of frameworks for uh, processing based, for example, on a um, distributed cache, such as, for example, Apache Ignite or Hazelcast Jet. There are also some variants that uh, are third-party client libraries, like, for example, Kafka Streams. Which one of these is most convenient for use case depends on the particular needs of the project, but the fact that Apache Spark provides that many features in such a large community makes it one of the, um, at present, uh, most uh, potentially good frameworks to choose uh, for, for a project that needs to have big data processing capabilities. Uh, as we mentioned, it provides a mechanism to distribute, distribute load over a large number of nodes using different cluster managers. And by default, uh, there is a built-in built standalone manager. And apart from the variety of operations on the data sets that Spark provides, there is a very uh, rich, feature-rich machine learning library that's being developed uh, with a number of new features that can facilitate further data processing capabilities for your application. So that was about Apache Spark. Thank you for your attention.